Now to a House oversight hearing on the Kaiserslautern Military Community Center being built in Germany to serve more than 50,000 U.S. military personnel living in the area. Construction has been delayed by over three years and is over budget by an estimated $80 million. This is an hour and a half. The committee will please come to order. On June 28, 2007, almost exactly a year ago today, this committee held an oversight hearing on the Defense Department's single largest construction project in the world, a massive 840,000 square foot mall being built in Germany called the Kaiserslautern Military Community Center, also referred to as the K-Town Mall. This facility will have an eight-story, 350-room hotel. It will have a movie theater with stadium seating, large retail areas. A military spokeswoman called the K-Town Mall a smaller version of the Mall of America in Minnesota. Last year, GAO testified that this project was in serious trouble. They told us it was millions of dollars over budget, had no validated cost estimate, and had no working completion date. GAO told us about the mall's defective and continuously leaking roof, which was going to cost millions of dollars to repair. And GAO told us about serious construction mistakes, like kitchen e exhaust ducts sealed with flammable insulation. We also obtained a report from the Air Force Audit Agency detailing 35 different deficiencies in the Air Force's management of this project. And we were informed of several ongoing criminal investigations of U.S. officials involved with this project, including one official who fled to Dubai instead of agreeing to testify before this committee. During last year's hearing, officials from the Air Force essentially told us not to worry. They said that despite problems identified by GAO and the auditors, the project was under control. They promised that even if the project came in late, it would still be under budget. Part of good congressional oversight is sustained congressional oversight. So today we're having our second hearing on the K-Town Mall. Today we'll hear from the GAO team that has been tracking this project closely. Unfortunately, their testimony will sound like the movie Groundhog Day. The project has gone further over budget and has been further delayed. Here is what today's GAO report says. With few visible changes, no reliable construction completion date, rising repair costs, and continuing construction quality problems, the KMCC will continue to be a high-risk project. What is most troubling about this year's report is that, the, is that new problems are compounding the old ones. In addition to the faulty roof and the dangerous kitchen exhaust ducts, GAO has now identified long cracks in the concrete foundation of the building. Nobody yet knows the full extent of this damage, how long it will take to repair, or how much these repairs will cost. Another new concern GAO raises is that the Air Force is not counting millions of dollars of costs in its budget estimates. These include costs to design portions of the mall costs to rework deficiencies like the roof and the foundation, and costs to assign additional Air Force personnel to this project. JL has also raised serious questions about $38 million in German funds that have been provided for the project. Although the Air Force believes this is a grant from the German government, the Germans believe, apparently, that it's only a loan, and they expect to be repaid. Finally, GAO reports that the criminal investigations of U.S. officials involved with this project, quote, have matured significantly since our last hearing and that several officials are being investigated for dereliction of duty and bribery. Here is the bottom line. This facility was supposed to cost $120 million and be opened by 2006, but today, GAO projects that the project will cost well over $200 million and may not be open for business until sometime in 2009. Even at that point, GAO predicts it will likely take years before, before all issues related to this project, including litigation and potential construction quality problems, are resolved. 
As a result, 50,000 servicemen and women who live and work uh, on or near Ramstein Air Base lack modern facilities. Soldiers traveling to and from Iraq and Afghanistan are deprived of promised amenities, and service members around the world have reduced funding for morale, welfare, and recreation. At yesterday's hearing on Afghan ammunition contract, I said that over the last eight years there has been a complete breakdown in the procurement process. Today's hearing is more evidence of a pervasive dysfunction in Federal contracting. And this hearing is particularly frustrating because the glaring problems that we identified a year ago have not been fixed. We need accountability for problems like the ones that we found at the K Town Mall, and, these and those responsible ought to face appropriate consequences. We urgently need a new approach that welcomes oversight and demonstrates a commitment to fixing problems and protecting taxpayers from waste, fraud, and abuse. I look forward to working with all my colleagues to make this goal a reality. And I want to recognize Mr. Davis. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. And um, I want to thank you for returning to the subject of the Air Force's major construction project in Germany, dubbed the K Town Mall, uh, where I had the opportunity to visit uh, a few months ago. Uh, this building has become such a lingering, uh, costly mess, I think perhaps we should start calling it the Capital Visitor Center NATO Annex. A year ago, we heard testimony on significant problems plaguing the massive multipurpose complex designed to feature retail, hotel and entertainment space for use by American personnel stationed in Germany and for others passing through Ramstein, Ramstein en route to and from other parts of the world. At that hearing, the GAO witnesses said mismanagement and lack of oversight had resulted in significant cost overruns, schedule delays and construction deficiencies. And while any foreign construction effort is bound to involve unusual complexities and risks, those in charge of this development seem to have fallen into all those inherent traps, and, and they kept digging. Predictable difficulties were compounded by inadequate and unfocused high-level leadership early on, poor planning, badly designed requirements, and an inadequate number of trained personnel overseeing the project. Now, that was last year. GAO went back to K-Town earlier this year, and the new observations they bring us today don't describe a clear path out of this expensive international morass. Um, steps by the Air Force to augment oversight staff and strengthen internal controls have helped to gain some measure of control over the project. But those measures aren't enough to untangle the knot formed by, and we need to understand this, multiple funding sources, vaguely worded international agreements, and the need to navigate diplomatic process to resolve complex disputes involving German contractors and U.S. dollars. To bring the logjam that stalled the project for so long, the German government provided 25 million euro, or almost 39 million dollars, uh, to get construction workers back on the job. While all parties recognized the influx of money was necessary to get the project going again, the status of that funding is not altogether clear. GAO has characterized it as a loan. The Air Force claims the money the U.S. won't have to pay back the money. The bilateral agreement between the U.S. and the German governments calls the money pre-financing. Uh, no one is quite sure what it means. I hope this hearing will shed some additional uh, light on that. But this lingering confusion about key issues doesn't bode well for completing construction by the end of this year, a forecast both the Air Force and the GAO already consider highly unlikely. In any case, we have a great deal of money invested in the project and substantial funds remain at risk. We need to be sure this project is completed properly and that future projects don't fall prey to the same oversight lapses and mistakes that steered this project into the ditch and kept it there. I hope this hearing will focus on what needs to be done to get this project back on track and the hard lessons that the Air Force and others need to learn to ensure the integrity of any future agreements governed by the terms of the current Status of Forces Agreement in Germany. And I think that's what's critical here, is you have international agreements here uh, that have made this uh, far more complex than the ordinary uh, being just a government contracts problem. Investigators from the GAO are here today to provide their views on this issue. We commend them for their hard work. We also value the experience and the perspectives that the Air Force witnesses bring to this discussion. Much is at stake in terms of U.S. tax dollars and in terms of providing our troops the best possible overseas accommodations while deployed overseas. We look forward to today's testimony and to a frank and constructive discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, we are pleased to welcome the following witnesses to our hearing today. Judith Garber is Deputy Assistant Secretary of the European and Eurasian Affairs Bureau at the, at the Department of State. 
Major General Mark E. Rogers is the Vice Commander of the United States Air, Force, Air Forces in Europe. Greg Kutz is the Managing Director of the Office of Forensic Audits and Special Investigations at the Government Accountability Office. Bruce A. Casso is a senior level contract and procurement fraud specialist in the Office of Forensic Audits and Special Investigations at GAO. And Terrell G. Dorn is the Director of Physical Infrastructure at GAO. The committee also requested testimony from Herbert Hyman, the Managing Director of LBB, the German government office that supervises the KMCC construction project. Mr. Hyman wrote the committee a letter stating that he would not be able to participate in today's hearing. I ask unanimous consent that Mr. Hyman's letter be placed in the hearing record and without objection that will be the order. We welcome all of our panelists, uh, witnesses today. Um, we welcome all of you today to testify. It's the, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses testify under oath. So I would like to ask if you would please rise and reach, raise your right hand. Do you um, solemnly swear the uh, testimony that you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Record will indicate that uh, each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statements will be made part of the record uh, in full. We would like to ask you, if you would, to limit your oral presentation to uh, five minutes. And uh, we will have a clock. It will be green. Uh, at the last minute it will turn yellow and then after the five minutes is up it will turn red and when you see the red light we would like to ask you to uh, conclude. Ms. Garber, why don't we start with you. There is a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to press it and pull the mic close enough to you. I am pleased to be here today and I will be ready to answer any questions. I do not have an oral statement. No. You do not have a statement? No. Okay. Uh, General Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The United States Air Forces in Europe appreciates the opportunity to appear today and update you on the KMCC. This facility is important to ensure that future retail goods, services, morale and recreation activities, and mission related lodging facilities are available to our military members and their families who live in the Kaiserslautern military community. These services are all currently available to our forces, but the quality of service is hampered by early Cold War era facilities. They are old, dispersed, have high maintenance costs, frustrating parking deficiencies and space limitations. I first became engaged on the KMCC in December of 2006 when I chaired the KMCC Oversight Council for the first time as the new Vice Commander of USAFE. By that time the project was months late. Quality defects had been identified and arguments were ongoing between the USAFE project office and LBB, the con construction agent, because USAFE was not paying invoices and contractors were continuing to walk off the site due to non-payment. Additionally, I was briefed on a dra draft audit by the Air Force Audit Agency that USAFE personnel had improperly paid invoices and that the Air Force Office of Special Investigations was, was investigating two personnel for possible wrongdoing. The commander of USAFE at that time directed me to take charge of an effort to do three things. Investigate the reason for the delays and failures in KMCC. Find out who is accountable for any failures, mismanagement or wrongdoing. And three, lead an effort with our German partners to find a strategic solution to completing the KMCC. I found that USAFE personnel had indeed improperly paid invoices. According to the GAO, those funds have been recovered. Investigations continue and once complete, responsible individuals will be held accountable. I also found that Air Force internal controls found the initial wrongdoing, properly identified quality defects, and preserved our taxpayer money. And I found many previous decisions by USAFE leaders were fortuitous and positioned us to keep costs under control and enforce quality performance. We stood up a task force and have been conducting root cause analysis on about 35 different potential causes for delays and failures. This analysis is complex and continues. However, many conclusions have already proven useful in working with our German partners for solutions. Some work has continued over the past, years, uh, the past year and I brought a few photos to show that there are bright spots in the progress. So if you put up the first photo, 
just so we all know, Mr. Chairman, what we're talking about is there is an image of the KMCC. The tall portion, of course, is the hotel portion. And all of the green area you see is the green roof over the mall portion. It's a very complex and, as you said, huge facility, reputed to be DOD's largest single facility project in the world. Next slide, please. Uh, there's an image of the front entry to mall. Next. That's an image of the hotel portion as it stands today. Next, please. That's an image inside the hotel lobby. Next. That is one of the rooms in the hotel that has been outfitted with furniture. All the rooms are essentially complete. There are 27 rooms that have finishes to be done, and we've outfitted one with furniture uh, for visitors who want to see what this is going to look like. Next. That is the Ramstein Tickets and Tours Office, one of the morale, welfare, and recreation offices in the building. Next. This is the mall concourse showing the entryways to some of the vendor shops. Next. And that photo is 90 degrees out, but it is office space in the building. Next. I think that's the last slide. So there has been some progress over the past year, although minimal, because contractors were essentially trying to not be in default of a contract. Uh, German leadership has worked hard to pick up the management and administrative train wreck of the KMCC and get construction on track. And due to their personal leadership, both federal and state level, it's now picking up steam with more workers on site and contractors have signed up to a new schedule. We want to thank our German counterparts for demonstrating commitment to our great partnership by standing up to responsibilities under the international agreement, stepping out with strong leadership, and I'm convinced the German government wants to get this facility finished as much as we do. There's been numerous rumors surrounding the cost and quality, extended delays on this project in the past year, and since the committee's hearing, we've strengthened the management, corrected all the discrepancies, and the GAO has not found any new ones. Uh, we're frustrated and disappointed. But we're doing everything we can, sir, to get this done. That concludes my opening statement. And as you mentioned, I have a written statement for the record. We appreciate your interest, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Rogers. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kutz, why don't we hear from you next and the, your colleague. Oh, oh just a minute. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Dorn, we'll start and I'll finish. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Davis, members of the committee, construction projects can be broken down into three fundamental areas, cost, schedule, and quality. Optimization of those three areas is the goal of good project management, but in the case of KMCC, none of the three went Air Force's way. There have been serious quality issues, escalating and still uncertain project costs, and a schedule that is likely to deliver the project at least three years late. This morning I will cover the construction quality and schedule issues, and then Mr. Coots will discuss the cost issues. A year ago, the serious KMCC quality issues we discussed included a defective roof and kitchen exhaust ductwork that did not comply with U.S. fire code standards. Both needed to be ripped out and replaced. Schedule-wise, no one knew when the project would be, com would be finished, and in fact, the contractors had all but abandoned the site. Project management and internal controls were inadequate, and there were allegations of fraud. Since then, there has been a lot of progress in some areas and almost none in others. First, the good news. Since the committee's last oversight hearing, Air Force has made great progress in addressing internal controls and has quadrupled the size of its KMCC project management office, with a particular focus on staff training in acquisition management, construction management, and financial management. In addition, General Rogers, assisted by State Department, met with high-level German officials to cooperatively work out the details necessary to improve oversight of the project by LBB, who is the German government's construction agent in Rhineland Falls. They also laid the groundwork for the German government to pay its contractors and to get them back to work. Now the not so good news. The new internal controls and the new processes and the new project management office have hardly been tested because insignificant progress has been made in construction over the last 12 months. Our review of the latest construction schedule furnished to Air Force by LBB was not encouraging. The schedules for the mall portion and the hotel portion of the project were not integrated 
to show how they might affect each other. It was also not clear from the schedule what contractor resources, such as crew sizes, were necessary to keep the project on time. The project's critical path, which is supposed to show what tasks need to be completed by certain dates to keep the project on schedule, was not clear. However, it was clear from the schedule that some tasks were already late. Given those issues, finishing all construction and fire alarm testing in the mall and hotel by the end of January 2009 is very unlikely. And given that AFES may need as many as four months to take the building from the Air Force's definition of complete to the day the first customer buys a pair of shoes, it is foreseeable that we may be waiting at least one year from today before the buildings are fully occupied. Here are a few slides to better illustrate the lack of construction progress over the last year. This first slide is a side-by-side -side comparison of the food court area just inside the mall's entrance. On the left, 2007, and on the right, 2008. This next slide shows a similar lack of progress in the mall's name brand restaurant. If progress can be defined as ripping out defective work, then some progress has been made on the kitchen exhaust ductwork and the roof. Demolishing and replacing the KMCC's roof began this spring, but the work is extensive, must be done in sections, and would not be completed for some time. In addition, we have identified that the KMCC project was not an isolated failure. Several other projects constructed more or less concurrently for the Air Force by LBB Kaiser Slaughtern also experienced significant cost, schedule, and quality issues. On this slide, you'll see a logistics distribution facility designed to be an open bay and to not have interior columns. It now has 43 temporary columns running down the center of the building to keep the roof from collapsing. A forklift operator running into one of those columns and collapsing a portion of the roof was the nightmare scenario of one official we interviewed. This last photo is from our return visit to Ramstein in March of this year. It shows large ponding that formed next to a runway extension that was built by LBB as part of the Rhine Mine Transition Program. The ponding not only attracted waterfowl, which is something you don't want around an airfield, but also repeatedly shorted out the runway lights, causing the possible diversion of aircraft to other bases. Clearly, LBB's recent track record of construction for the Air Force Indica indicates that increased oversight to protect U.S. tax dollars is required now and in the foreseeable future. And now Mr. Kutz will highlight the KMCC's cost issues. Given the problems Mr. Dorn just described, you might be wondering what the total cost of this project will be. Unfortunately, because certain costs have not been tracked by the Air Force, nobody will ever fully know. If you could put the pie chart up for us. This pie chart on the monitor shows the elements of total cost, including that red slice that is referred to as unknown costs. The amounts shown are estimates by the Air Force and the German Construction Agency of the total U.S. dollar cost at completion. The biggest piece of the pie, or the black piece there, is construction cost. This $163 million represents primarily charges for trade contractor work. Other costs shown relate to foreign currency, rework, design and other contracted services, and furniture and equipment. When added up, the total estimate for this amount, or these amounts here, is $214 million. The unknown, or the red piece there, represents millions of dollars of contingencies and other costs that are not tracked as part of the KMCC. For example, the cost of Air Force staff overseeing the project are not captured. Other unknown include hindrance claims and estimates of cost to repair the new cracks in the floor. In addition to the $214 million estimate and the unknowns, there are other real costs resulting from the problems and delays. For example, for every month of delay, it is estimated that $500,000 of profits are lost from operation of the shopping mall and the restaurants. In total, if the project opens three years late, which is the best case scenario, these lost profits and additional costs will approach $20 million. As the Chairman mentioned, last year the Air Force testified that KMCC was under budget. Many of the members of the committee expressed concern and wondered how that could possibly be true. Last week, Air Force officials briefed your staffs and told you the same thing. 
Let me clarify some of the facts related to this representation. For this project, what you have is a 35 percent increase in the euro dollar exchange rate, at least three years of delay, over $10 million of rework, and millions of dollars of improper payments. Further, funding partner records reveal substantial cost overruns. For example, the largest funding source for KMCC is the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. According to their records, their piece of the construction pie you see alone is $24 million or 45 percent over budget. Their worst case estimate is a $59 million or 110 percent cost overrun. Clearly, KMCC will cost substantially more than the Air Force and its funding partners envisioned at the beginning of this project. Their budget number they're speaking about, it represents the congressionally authorized spending limits for the construction piece of the pie. Last year I testified that KMCC was from the beginning a high risk overseas project with minimal Air Force oversight. As Mr. Dorn mentioned, Air Force has, since your hearing last year, substantially increased its oversight. Improvements include more and better trained staff, standardized procedures, and enhanced disbursement controls. We believe these improved controls reduce, reduce the risk of fraudulent and improper payments. In conclusion, the people most impacted by the problems at KMCC are military members and their families. The tens of millions of dollars of cost overruns and lost profits have reduced the money that's available for morale, welfare, and recreation programs worldwide. We're encouraged that the Air Force has beefed up its oversight of this project. Given the problems with other large pro projects at Ramstein, we believe they should provide this enhanced oversight for all future projects. Mr. Chairman, this ends our statement. We look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Casso. You're here to answer questions. Mr. Okay. Uh, without objection, we'll proceed for uh, 10 minutes on each side, 10 minutes controlled by the majority, and then 10 minutes controlled by the minority. And I'll start off the questions. Mr. Kurtz, when you testified before us last year, you identified several severe construction deficiencies at this uh, K-Town Mall. One of, these was the, um, one of these was the roof. And as you said last year, this roof had major defects and leaked continually. As a result, the water was damaging other aspects of the construction. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now, last year, you couldn't tell us how much it was going to cost to fix this roof, but in your report today, you have a number. Uh, you say it's going to cost $10.8 million. Is that right? That's an Air Force estimate, yes. Okay. Uh, that's a major setback. The original cost estimate for the whole project was $131 million, and now it's going to cost more than 8 percent of that just to repair the roof. Is it possible that this number could go up? Yes, it is, because as I mentioned, the exchange rate we're talking about for the euro dollar, you know that they're being, being billed in euros. Since your hearing last year has gone up 16 percent, mm -hmm. and certainly materials have gone up and other costs have gone up, so it's possible it will come in higher. Uh, that is yet to be determined. They're in the first and second phases of a multi-phase roof replacement. Okay. Um, last year, uh, you, you gave us your testimony, and this year you found even more problems. Your report describes major cracks in the concrete, and I think we have a, a picture of an example of that. Can you tell us more about uh, these cracks? Or where else did you find them? These cracks are in the in the floor, and uh, what you're looking at is probably defective concrete. The Germans, uh, working with the Air Force, have a consultant, who uh, a, a proof engineer they call him in, in Germany, who's investigating to see why that concrete is is that way. It was probably um, a bad mix, or not, or too much water, not enough water. Um, it's at this point, I would say it's not structural because it's it's on the floor. It's like a topping slab over the existing slab. But it could affect whatever floor finishes go in over top of that. Does this raise new concerns about construction quality? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I, I would recommend that the um, in this 
relative law in construction that the Air Force and their consultants go over that facility with a fine tooth comb looking for other quality control issues. Some of these defects we heard about last year, some of these are new. Uh, are you worried that there might be other defects that aren't readily visible? In other words, defects that you wouldn't see just by walking around? That is correct. I, I do expect that they will find latent defects. Uh, General, uh, how much is it going to cost to repair the concrete? To uh, sir, I don't know. That is in the German courts and uh, Germany is fixing the cracks. I understand that contractors make mistakes, but these are serious flaws. The Air Force should have, uh, should have people inspecting the architectural plans before the designs are, are approved, and they should have people overseeing construction before things are installed incorrectly. But that didn't happen here. I would like to ask a few questions about when the K-Town Mall project will be completed. General, as I understand it, the Air Force uh, broke ground on this project in the summer of 2004. At that time, the plan was for the hotel to open in December 2005 and the mall to open July 2006. Isn't that right? That sounds right, sir. But this deadline was missed. So the next deadline the Air Force set was April of 2007. Isn't that right? Uh, sir, the Air Force did not set those deadlines. 2005 in December was the mission need date. But when the German construction agent told us that couldn't be met, they established April. We accepted that because we don't control their schedule, really. Uh, later slippages were the same way. Uh, they basically do this work since we have no contracts with the construction workers, uh, companies. Uh, so every time they give us a slippage, it's a slippage. We can complain, but mm -hmm. it's up to them to respond and fix schedules. Mr. Kutz, you. Uh According to your report, um, the current plan is for the project to be turned over in January of 2009. Is that your estimate? No, we don't really have an estimate. We haven't seen a legitimate estimate. As Mr. Dorn mentioned in his opening statement, middle to late 2009 is probably the best case scenario where you'll see actually people shopping and staying at the hotel. But there is no estimate right now that we're comfortable it has uh, f legitimate support behind it. Is that an estimate of the completion of the project? I'll have to, the general is going to have to answer that. We Not don't really clear. know if there is a legitimate estimate. I don't think there is a legitimate. That may be the last date that they have thrown out there is January 2009, but that isn't even really when they are going to have people in. That was when the keys kind of get turned over. You would have to add several months to that to do the final finishing and to get the restaurants ready and the hotels ready. So mm -hmm. that would be plus three or four months and that would be certainly the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, General, let me understand this. The project was supposed to take two years, 2004 to 2006. Now the best case scenario is that it will take at least five years, 2004 to 2009. Is that the situation, best that's, case? That is about right, sir. Um, Mr. Cutts, in your written testimony, you raised concerns that the project may not be finished even by this newest projected completion date, and you just indicated some of these uh, a minute ago. Um, we just don't know for sure then when this project is going to be completed. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Is that correct, Mr. General? Yes, sir. I would say that uh, the, the January 09 completion date given to us by the construction agent probably has more fidelity than any we've seen in over two years. But whether or not the construction agent is able to actually pull that off, I don't know. Uh, I do have more faith in it than in the past, but. Mm -hmm probably wouldn't bet on it being complete by then, okay. maybe a few months delay. We also want to explore the total cost of this project. We seem to have a disagreement among the panelists about how much the K-Town Mall will actually cost. General Rogers, you state in your testimony that your budget estimate is $162.9 million, which is below the amount authorized by Congress. But Mr. Cuts, in your report, you conclude that tens of millions of dollars of other project costs are not included in the Air Force cost estimates. So let's just walk through these. Uh, general construction costs paid out so far are $121.7 million, and you estimate it will take about $41.2 million more to complete constructions. Uh, that's how you got to your uh, number of 162.9. Uh, isn't that right? Yes, sir. Okay. 
Mr. Kutch, you say this excludes other costs. For example, it doesn't count $16.3 million for furniture and equipment. Is that uh, right? That's correct. And, General, why don't you count the cost of the furniture? Uh, are you going to get the furniture for free? Oh, no, sir. That was planned all along, but it was never reported in the same channels. And the questions in the past have not been about such things as furniture. They've been about construction. But the Air Force has tracked these costs all along for secondary services, furniture and equipment, uh, any other kinds of costs that are normal in standing up a facility. And we don't report those numbers routinely in any construction project, mm -hmm. although we have them budgeted and we know what they'll cost. In uh, September 05, we submitted a new 1391, which is the form that comes over to Congress to get approval for a uh, total cost of a facility. That was approved by Congress in January 2000, uh, yes, 2006. And we said at that time that total cost for construction and furniture, equipment, secondary services, design, the entire bit would be $210 million ceiling. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kuss, does that explain the, what appears to be the discrepancies in yeah, your testimony? Yeah, I think last year it was confusing, too, because the Air Force representative uh, simply focused on the construction piece. But that is not the project. The project does include, as you mentioned, furniture and equipment. There are additional foreign currency translation charges that have gone against certain other appropriations, and there's other things like rework, design, and other contracts. Those are really costs of the project. So you have to look at this in a more holistic approach. And when you look at the whole thing, you're talking about over $200 million. And when you look at the whole thing, that includes uh, uh, fixing the kitchen ducts for $1.2 million, or the cost of currency fluctuation because of these delays for another $8.6 million. When you add all these up, you get an estimate of $213.9 million. Is at 63 percent more than the original cost estimate of $131.1 million. Isn't that right? About, yes. That's about correct. You, you've also estimated how much the Air Force pays to house officials and other hotels while this facility is still being built. On page 16 of your testimony, you say this amount will be $2.9 million by January 2009. The, the, the best case estimate for completion date. You also estimate the amount of revenue lost from retail sales to be another $14 million. So if you include these amounts, by my calculations, you're up to more than $230 million. And that doesn't even include other costs like all of the additional Air Force staff assigned to this contract or the cost to fix the cracks in the concrete foundation. Is that correct? Yeah, those are related costs. Certainly they are uh, a little bit different in their nature. But yes, they are resultant from the problems and delays we are talking about. And they do much of that impact soldier morale, welfare, recreation programs, as we both mentioned in the opening there. General Rogers, I don't understand how you can continue to tell this committee that the project is under budget. It seems you, that you are deliberately excluding millions of dollars worth of costs just so that uh, we get this, this somewhat misleading statement. And I think the taxpayers deserve more, uh, more of a clear explanation. Uh, if the, uh, could you answer that, respond yes, to that? There is no deliberate shading here, sir. Those kind of costs to send these people off base, for example, exist today. They existed in the past. Uh, what is lost here is an opportunity cost to save that money because it is not open. The cost today to send people off base is not nearly what it was, uh, say, a couple years ago. For the first four months of this year, for example, the cost to send people off base to lodging was about $1,200 a month. It surged in May and uh, yeah, April, May because of an exercise we had, but it is back to normal now. Well, when you take all of those costs into consideration, you said we would incur them anyway. Uh, do you agree with the estimate of uh, all of them combined, uh, $230 million? Uh, yes, sir, but it is not mm -hmm. the same as it is not the issue we are talking about. We are talking about the controllable parts of construction and other management uh, controls we can have. A lot of these costs are things that you would include in the cost of doing business of opening any facility. We don't include the cost of the roof rework, the hindrance claims, um, concrete repair, et cetera, because we are under no liability to pay those. Currency fluctuation is a major portion of this problem. Since this project began, we have experienced a total of $47 million of expenses due to currency fluctuation alone. And as you know, we can't control that. If the project was delivered on time, top quality, in 06, 
we would have paid out $32 million in foreign, foreign currency fluctuation. The delays so far have been worth $15 million of additional foreign currency fluctuation costs. Okay. So those parts, this, this is the equivalent of buy low, sell high. We set these contracts when the dollar was at its strongest in Europe and at the same time construction contracts could be had for a minimum. Today in Germany there is what I would call a Katrina effect. Uh, contracts are very high, materials are up. Uh, it's difficult to, to bring anything in uh, very cheaply today. It's one reason the construction manager has had such a difficulty in getting contractors back to work because they are, there are much more lucrative contracts out there to be had and they're tied to this one settled back in 2004. Thank you very much. We're going to have other questions. I'm sure other members will ask questions. Uh, Mr. Davis. So, General Rogers, let me just understand. Basically, the fact that the euro has risen so much against the dollar accounts for a, 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 an important part of the cost rise. A uh, very important part, sir, yes. And, and, and you have no control over that. Now, how about in hiring the construction uh, contractors? Uh, that wasn't uh, the Air Force, was it? No, sir. We do business with the German government under the international agreement known as ABG 75. Well, let me ask Ms. Garber. I mean, it looks like a huge part of this problem was that the construction, the contractors in this case, were German contractors hired by the German government, and our only job was to approve the work and pay. Is that, is that a fair understanding, or am I missing something? ABG 75 provides a framework for these military construction activities to take place. Can you speak in the microphone? I'm That's sorry. right. So a ABG 75 provides a framework for these military construction contracts to take place. Yeah, I understand that. And yeah. is my understanding of that framework uh, correct? That basically the hiring of the contractors, the German government does that. We basically approve the work and pay the government who then pays the contractor. Isn't that the way it works? Article 49 of the U.S.-German Supplementary well, Agreement. Just yes or no. I don't need to get into all the article. Is, is that a correct understanding? The, the supplemental SOFA provides that the military construction for the benefit of foreign forces stationed in Germany should be carried out by German authorities. That's correct. Okay. So, so a lot of this problem just goes back to the German government, who they hired, and uh, is, is that fair to say? Let me ask Gio. And that, that's I understand cool. there was some work at, at one point, it was before General Rogers got into it, that there was some work that was approved and accepted that probably shouldn't have been accepted. That's true, sir. Uh, as far as the, uh, the United States influence or control over the contracting process, uh, the United States can request uh, a contracting uh, approach. In this case, the United States did not opt for or did not go for a general contractor approach. So the, so the Germans went with what they call trade lots, essentially 40 small business or uh, trade lot contractors, individuals, and then they they attempted, the uh, LBB attempted to manage that. That was a uh, significant problem for them. They were effectively and Some of these contractors walked off the job, didn't they? They walked off the job because they weren't getting paid. So, uh, you know, no, no money. They weren't no. getting paid because they weren't doing good work. It, it wasn't, I don't believe it was, that was necessarily the case. It was that the invoices that they were ultimately when they were providing uh, their invoices and they were coming through because the change orders had not been approved. This is when the Air Force stepped in and said, we're not going to pay any invoices for unapproved change orders. When that occurred, the funding stopped, the contractors walked off the job. That's, a, that's certainly a, a control that the United States had. The question And if they be, had paid these contractors and with unapproved change orders, they'd probably be up before this committee trying to answer why you paid unapproved change orders. Absolutely. And there were improper payments that had been made in, uh, at, at a, up until a certain point and then it was finally discovered. But the, the, the question is whether or not the United States had the ability or the authority to inject greater oversight and control in the process from the beginning. And the answer to that under the ABG 75 is clearly yes. Well, that's, I mean, that, but that, that's uh, horses long since out of the barn. I mean, that's, we're where we are today. That's correct. Uh, that's so now before anybody here was forward. on the scene. So, uh, you know, we're where we are. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it should be a lesson learned for the Air Force and Absolutely. the state and everybody else in terms of future projects, in terms of what can go wrong. I guess the question is today, as we look at this today, and we see where we are in trying to get this completed as rapidly as possible, uh, given all of the other factors, the fact that construction costs are high, that you still have a rising euro against the dollar, um, that we don't have direct control under the contractual arrangement that we have, 
what's the fastest way to get this thing wrapped up as quickly as we can at the best cost? Um, and is the Air Force doing a satisfactory job on that? And that's the question. Well, we I think certainly the Air Force has instituted effective controls at this point. As, as Mr. Dorn indicated, those So they're doing a satisfactory job. That's at this correct. Point. But okay. the question is those controls have not really been tested yet because there hasn't been sufficient progress. But have they, do they have adequate infrastructure and oversight in yeah. place? From your perspective, looking forward, are they doing everything they can do? It, it appears so, yes. Okay. And I think the Air Force, in terms of to be commended for the actions in terms of engaging the German government and getting them to uh, put forth funds to stem the process and get it going. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the German government can't feel too good about this project. I'm not going to ask you to comment in terms of what they feel, but just looking at this, I'm sure it's a, it, it's a source of some embarrassment to them, which is probably why they kicked in uh, some money at this point to, to, to get it going. What is the status of those dollars that the German government put in? Uh, do they expect to get that back at this point? Do they just kind of add it to the cost? Is, can anybody on the record, uh, uh, Ms. Garber, I'll start with you as for State Department, any idea what this uh, the money they kicked in, what is the status of that? What do we expect to get back? Will that be an added reimbursement for us? If it is an added reimbursement, we have to do it under the euro as it, as it rises. I mean, can you give me a feel for that? State Department was not involved in that particular piece, so I think the Air Force is best place to answer that so question. So you don't have the answer to that, okay. Uh, yes, sir. General Rogers. Sir, when we went to the Germans and laid out failures uh, of their agents, uh, we asked them for solutions to this problem. Uh, they agreed with us that the real problem is lack of flow of money. If you don't keep the money flowing, construction doesn't proceed. Though uh, contractors don't work for free, in other words. Yes, sir. They are not liquid uh, enough to carry any costs and worry about it. Okay. Yes, sir. This money that's been injected by the Germans as pre-financing was their solution to that problem to sustain liquidity in the project. Now, did we sign a note for that, that they advance this and we sign a note and we pay them later or anything no, like sir. that? No, sir. We never signed any paperwork. Uh, we didn't get any of the money. We have no control over the money. So they just uh, paid, went ahead and paid their own contractors ahead of time with no understanding uh, from us that we'd reimburse them as far as you know? Yes, sir. And they, you know, we really don't know exactly what they're doing with the money. Uh, there are contractors involved, there are previous costs involved, and we're staying out of it because under advisement by our legal staff, if we stick our finger in it, we could create liability. So we've stayed out of that completely. What do you see the, um, how do you see this moving forward at this point? There are still, as we saw from the pictures that were put up there, there has been no progress in some areas over, over the last year. True. Um, we have a plan now, the GAO has testified, you have controls in place that they, they are satisfied with at least to date. They haven't been tested and we all understand that, but, but at least you have them in place. They've given you good marks for moving ahead. How do you see this progressing on a timeline or getting contractors back in there working? Um, you know, can you walk us through what we can expect from Ron? Yes, sir. The, uh, the real test on whether we're making good progress is to have the worker count adequate to meet the construction schedule they have created. You have enough workers to get the job done? Yes, sir. We have not seen that yet. The German authorities You don't are, control that either, do you? No, sir. The German authorities are doing what they can with the contractors, but as I mentioned uh, about the constructing environment in Germany, uh, they have some challenges in dealing with these contractors. To put it bluntly, uh, they're holding the cards with the government. Uh, the measures the government is taking uh, are to be commended, but not all the problems are solved yet. We have seen work progress on the roof. We've seen kitchen ducting removed, but we understand there are additional details they're having difficulty working out so with the, the big, uh, contractors. So the big variable, the big delta here in terms of being able to get this thing done on time and cutting our losses is getting the workers there to perform to standards in a timely manner, yes, and sir. that's something we don't control. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that. Yes. Yeah, I think so, yes, sir. And is there anything else we can do to make this happen? I mean, obviously, don't go this route in the future when you're constructing this time of building, because this is one case of, uh, you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. But is there anything else we could be doing at this point, uh, except for maybe a phone call from the president to Ms. Merkel or something like that. I mean, what else can you do at this point to get the contractors? Short of writing a blank check, 
um, to bring more workers in and pay them more than they're contracted to do? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so we still have the unresolved issue of, may, of trying to get the contractors in in a timely manner to get this thing done. And that's the variable that nobody controls here. You think we're doing everything we can. It goes back then to the initial agreement this before anybody was here on this panel was here in terms of uh, the contractual vehicle that would handle this where we allowed the German government basically to hire the contractors uh, to make this go and things started going bad from there. We, we made a mistake along the way at one point evidently in accepting some work that wasn't acceptable but that's not the major part of the problem. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say, but I think the agreement itself also has provisions that the United States did not take full advantage of in terms of its risk mitigation. There are opportunities that the U.S. has to inject itself into the process for oversight control, checking and checks and balances and that type of thing. And they're doing ABG that now. 75. But we're doing that now. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I pick up right where you just left off? What, because that's the um, th the suggestion is that uh, we're now at a place where um, we're sort of being held hostage by these German contractors and so forth. Uh, but like you said, it didn't have to come to that. And I'm curious as to uh, well, first of all. How typical or atypical is it for um, this kind of situation to arise where work stops and then a third party enters the scene um, ap apparently without objection uh, and, and starts funding the project that we're supposed to have control or oversight on? Then, then creating expectations of some kind of disposition of, of that outlay of funds down the line, which apparently is not totally resolved yet. I mean, this strikes me as out of the ordinary. Am I correct in that? That's our understanding, yes. It's, uh, I believe, the first time the Germans have engaged in this type of a pre-financing loan, however you want to, whatever no, semantic term well, you Well, even use. just going beyond the Germans, I mean, even, on a project of this kind, you wouldn't expect to see that kind of uh, situation arise, right? No, I don't believe so. Okay. And you, you suggested that it's because we didn't take advantage of earlier warning signs, things we could have done, presumably before it got to a stage where the contractors felt they had to walk off. Well, bef before it got to a stage where we had to do a stop work Correct. kind of order. Um, and then force these contractors, in effect, to walk off the job because they weren't getting paid and then invite the third-party German government to come into the situation. What are some of the things, what are some of the earlier stages that we could have taken advantage of um, to avoid that? Well, at the very outset of the, uh, of the ar arrangement or the agreement, the U.S. has the ability to inject itself in terms of reviewing the uh, uh, the construction, on-site quality control, oversight of the process, uh, the invoices, all the change orders, the fact that there was such a huge backlog of change orders and that the invoices were being paid associated with those before the, the change orders had been approved suggests that, you know, the government of the United States was not, you know, adequately monitoring the process at that time. Uh, that all caught up when these, the, the, the surge of change orders hit and it was finally realized, you know, holy cow, we're paying for stuff that we haven't approved yet. And so then it was, we're not going to, we're not going to process any further payments. That, that obviously created the dilemma. So in, injecting the, uh, the, the adequate amount of oversight resources up front would have mitigated that risk. How fast, based on your, I mean, you do reviews of these kinds of projects in other instances as well and have a general sense of how a contract um, proceeds over time and when the, where, the trigger, where the trigger mechanisms are. So, I mean, how fast, if you have an efficient oversight and monitoring role in place, 
how fast should you be able to detect things that you need to weigh in on? I mean, this project started when? What was the start time on this project? 04? Fall of 04. Is Fall of 04. So on a project of this size and, and complexity, you know, uh, granted, if you have a good oversight function in place, how quickly could you expect to know? I mean, two months out, three months out, six months out. I mean, here we are for four years out. We, we, looked, we looked at this last year, so say three years out. But I mean, a good oversight operation should be able to judge whether things are going in the right direction or not, how quickly. I'd say a couple of months, Mr. Charles. A couple Charbonne. of months. A yes. couple of months, you're going to know. That's, you've that's got correct. Construction is normally like 30 days in arrears, so, but, but you're, if you're out there every day, you're going to see what's going on. Right. One of the things that they didn't do early, and I'll be brief, is they didn't have a, a schedule that they could trust. The, the Germans are giving them Excel spreadsheets instead of a network schedule that showed what resources were needed. So they didn't have the tools necessary to even know how many people were going to be on the site. And they don't have that tool today. They still couldn't tell you how many people need to be on the site today to make sure you're on schedule. So tracing back to, I mean, if I were interested in knowing exactly how the oversight role broke down, where does that path lead? Was it that there should have been 10 people overseeing this and there was only one? That, that there should have been somebody with more experience and background in doing that kind of thing, and there wasn't anyone? I mean, what, what was the breakdown in terms of the failure to do the early oversight specific? You want to take that one? Okay. It's, um, again, it, it gets back to <clears throat> what Mr. Mr. Casso said. Um, in the beginning, we had the option to, um, you know, insist on, a, on a general, one general contractor, for example, and instead we had over 20 general contractors effectively. <clears throat> and trying to manage that many contractors um, Okay, is so I'm running out of time, but it sounds like right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. The structure about. of this was such that it was going to lead to confusion, um, missed oversight, and all the rest of it, and here we are. It, absolutely. Made it a high-risk job, as Mr. Coots yeah. said. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Um, uh, Mr. Um, Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, folks, for coming in to testify. Mr. Cutts, ex ex particularly, I want to thank uh, GAO for helping us understand what went wrong with this particular project. But in your report, you also warned that there may be some construction problems that were also discovered in other places when you were looking at the installation in Germany. Uh, first, you showed us a picture of a runway at Ramstein Air Base. I think there's, a, a, in fact, a photo on the uh, screen there. Your report says this runway was built to help support an increase in U.S. mission to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, you said that the runway's lights don't work when it gets wet. And you said a construction defect allows groundwater to damage the lights and cause power outages. As a result, the base actually had to divert aircraft to other bases in Europe. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's correct. And now they're forced to use portable lights and they have to pump water from the manholes on an ongoing basis? Yes. Uh, it's hard to understand how this could happen. It, it, should there not have been some oversight uh, that identified the contractor who installed these lights and re somebody require repairs by them? Yeah, and it was the same LBB agency, I believe, that is overseeing the KMCC, which is why we looked at them. We looked to see if there were other similar types of issues in that immediate area that were L this LBB Kaiser Slaughter was involved with. And so we see the same kinds of things we saw with KMCC on a little bit smaller projects, but still important projects. And so did no one inspect the work before it was accepted by the U.S. government? Do you know? I, I don't know. Uh, we, don't, we don't know that. Does anybody on the panel know that? S say again the question, sir. Was, did not somebody inspect the work before it was accepted by the government? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, some of these projects were managed by another government agency. Uh, LBB, as the German construction agent, a German government organization, accepts from contractors on behalf of the forces. Uh, so when LBB accepted it, there was the first breakdown. Well, back to Mr. Kutz's report, it says that when it rains, ponds that are as big as acres across develop between the runways because of poor drainage. So I think you're saying that, again, we accepted that particular situation of construction without it ever being properly graded. Would that yeah, and that, that's the picture you see, with, and I think, several months ago. That was in March of this year. What's going on with the runway now? 
these guys were there. Let Terry and Bruce, they were there last month. They Mr. Can, Dorn, you know. what's happening now? Uh, as, of, as of last month, they had started grading operations to fill in those low spots, but they're still having trouble, and we watched them pump water out of the manholes. Right. So was that same company that was responsible brought back to do the repairs, or is some additional or new company in there doing the work? I'm not aware of that. Air Force probably is. Yeah, sir, that's, uh, those are items that we identified to the Germans as unacceptable. Uh, the construction agent and the German government is working with the contractors to repair these deficiencies. In the meantime, it's true that they impact certain capabilities out there. Uh, we've got measures in place to ensure safety and mission aren't impacted any more than necessary, but we're holding their feet to the fire to produce good results on this one. So we're not paying additional to have that done. They're coming back under the original contract and completing that. Is there any penalty involved? Well, so far, we're not paying anything. They haven't told us we're going to pay anything because we identified some of these most, in fact, all of the known ones that were shown here we identified prior to, uh, you know, when it was accepted. Because you can accept the runway for usage while other pieces can be repaired later. Punch list. So it was accepted for use but not accepted in terms of all responsibility. Yes, sir. And they own the problem of fixing it and the cost of doing that. Yes, sir. Ms. Garber, is that generally the recourse that the United States government has uh, from the German government or German contractors when a situation like this arises? I think the Air Force is the best place to, to answer that question. The State Department generally doesn't get involved in the technical construction issues and questions. Okay, and it never gets to a diplomatic level of, uh, of concern? In, in this particular case, because there were problems with the LBB agent, the embassy did play a facilitative role in trying to arrange meetings to let um, to facilitate and support to have bring the parties to agreement at the federal level. So in that sense, yes. But generally, these are handled by the Air Force directly. Mr. Chris, will you tell us what you found when you went to the warehouse in terms of the, uh, the structure there and deficiencies in the steel frame? Well, there were the beams that were inserted. I guess that's the picture there. Uh, and there was originally issues where this had to be evacuated because there was concern that the roof would cave in. So, and again, Mr. Dorn and Mr. Casso saw that last month. And, and those, I believe, that's a recent picture. And so the building can't be used to its full capacity. Some areas, I think you said, a forklift couldn't get into anymore. Is that right? That's yeah. correct. And so what's happening with that? They work. They have workarounds. They work around, and now we're just going to have a, a building that isn't up to the capacity originally designed. It's 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 a, essentially a huge basketball court with pillars in it, and it's a little difficult to play basketball in that scenario. But they've got forklifts moving equipment and other things around, and in some cases they can't get to uh, certain uh, certain locations easily, so they have to use either hand facilities or or, or workarounds. But as Mr. Dorn alluded, the uh, uh, one of the officers that we spoke with there said, you know, one of the things that he worries about significantly is a forklift backing into one of those pillars and I, the pillar falling or affecting the, uh, the structure of the roof. Right. The op they are using that facility. It is, there are operations, but they are degraded by the interior columns. So, General, have we accepted that? Have we paid for it? Are we going to pay in full? Is somebody going to assist on that? What's going on? Sir, that facility was accepted about three years ago by another government agency and the Germans notified us of the de defects in the building because they weren't visible to us. It has to do with the defective metal that was used in multiple government facilities throughout Germany, some German government projects, some U.S. Army projects. Uh, in conjunction with that, they found some defective wells in this one. It is now in the hands of German courts, and we're standing by for the German officials to tell us what their solution is. They'll tell us what our recourse is? Yes, sir. And this is, of course, dragged out with the court process over there. I see that my time is, is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Ms. Watson? Yeah, I just want to follow up on the question of uh, my colleague, Mr. Tierney. Uh, the committee staff received a briefing on June 30th from the Air Force Office of uh, Special Investigations. And at this briefing, Air Force investigators gave us some additional information and they said we could share it with certain limitations. Uh, they told us that they believed that two Air Force officers, two Air Force civilians, and a fifth individual who was a contract employee falsely certified almost $8 million in payments to German contractors. So this is a question for General Rogers, are you familiar with the investigation and these allegations? Yes, ma'am, I am. All right. And uh, 
Let me ask you this. Have you reprimanded or removed any of the Air Force personnel that was involved in the payments? I would put it this way, ma'am. One of them self-removed. Uh, the others, the investigations are not complete yet, but when they are complete, if it's warranted, we will take appropriate action, hold them accountable. Uh, to date, it appears that it's more of a process foul and lack of training versus intentional. Criminal uh, activity? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, not absolving them of responsibility to know, but the individual who self-eliminated also happened to run that office who had an interest in them, not, ne not necessarily knowing exactly how to do this job. Because the case is being investigated now, I think they're in court. Uh, if there are criminal activities, they will be adjudicated there. Is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. Okay. A civilian employee, it would go through the civilian process, Department of Justice. Military ones through the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It seems like there's been very poor conduct uh, by U.S. officials. So this question to Mr. Kuntz. Uh, program managers have an obligation to protect the taxpayers' funds, don't they? That's correct, yes. Okay. And do you think a government supervisor needs to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that someone engaged in criminal activity before taking any administrative action? We don't believe that because we come across that we refer hundreds and thousands of cases to agencies for criminal investigation and administrative action because, as you're probably well aware, criminal virtually never happens, but administrative should happen when someone does things. So uh, that's our view. And, and if, some, if, if it's proven, I mean, if someone's still being investigated, then that's one thing. But if you know that they, they did a poor job in their work, they should be... Uh, you know, reprimanded, their ratings should affect that, their performance ratings and things like that. And you're talking about, I think, here, individuals who were rubber stamping, if you will, the bills that came in versus other individuals who are under investigation for fraud. There are other cases of fraud. Well, when we see the pictures that were up on the screen and the shoddy kind of construction and, uh, you know, we look away or we wait for somebody to uh, maybe give us a clue that things are not right. Uh, it just is very troubling. We're the oversight committee, and we're here to protect the general public, the taxpayers' dollars, protect Americans. And uh, when we have these kinds of projects that seem to be not worthy of who we are, it's very troubling. And uh, we have all of you out there, and I appreciate you coming here today and being willing to testify. We, we need to get to the truth. And we need to remove those people who are demonstrating very poor judgment and poor, uh, shall I say, conduct, maybe because they expect a fiduciary reward in the end. That's always our concern. So uh, I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Um, I want to ask a few questions. Uh, Mr. Coates, uh, last year you testified before us on this project, and you told us that the Air Force's program office had lost control of project finances and was paying invoices for work they weren't sure it was done. At last year's hearing, the witness from the Air Force was Brigadier General Danny Gardner, who was in charge of the project at that time. He acknowledged some problems with the project, but he basically said the Air Force had addressed these problems. Uh, Mr. Kutz, if I recall correctly, you didn't um, agree with those assertions. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, it doesn't seem like the Air Force believed them either, because after our hearing, the commander of Air Forces in Europe, General Hobbins formed a high-level task force to troubleshoot the project, and by the following month, July 2007, it presented its findings to top Air Force officials supporting GAO's findings. Here's what the Air Force's own internal review stated, quote, Air Force did not properly monitor approved contractor payments. Air Force did not have adequate policies and controls in place, and Air Force did not have sufficient staffing to oversee complex projects. Uh, General Rogers, you're here in the Air Force seat today. Uh, 
Do you know? Do you do you agree that the Air Force did not adequately oversee this project? And did you agree? Do you agree with GAO's findings in that regard, sir? I've, as I mentioned earlier, I've been investigating this thing for 18 months, and I probably know more about it than anybody. Uh, what I found is. Uh, of course, I participated in this piece of it. The task force was directed by General Hobbins even prior to the hearing. We just had logistic difficulties getting stood up quick enough. The internal findings that you speak of by the Air Force, uh, the source for that was members from here in the air staff in the Pentagon. Those members were there for two weeks and had a short look. And their opinion I do not agree with. Uh, Initially, I did, but now I know better. Uh, as it turns out, the main crux of the problem was transparency from our construction agent. As an example, to know about change orders, the construction agent has to tell you they're there because we're not in their offices. Uh, in terms of controls, you have to know something's not quite right to ramp it up. Initially, the Air Force knew that this project was going to be more complex, and because we had tried to get a general contractor, actually written official letters to the Germans and couldn't get it, supported by the Minister of Defense of Germany, who also wrote letters saying, you've got to put a general contractor on this, we lost that fight, and LBB did not put a general contractor on it. So based on that, the Air Force doubled its normal oversight team size to eight in the beginning. But you disagree with the Air Force's own findings. Sir, the, those, you can't classify those as the Air Force's own findings. Those were members of a team who generated their briefing when they came back here, and they had far less information. So I, I don't, there are pieces of it that have some credibility, but you can't count those as the findings. Well, this was at the request of General Hobbins that they put together yes, this uh, inquiry. Not he directed me to lead it, sir. I see. And, on the chart, uh, they're titled findings. That said, uh, these are the findings that uh, were re that uh, findings is pursuant to an internal Air Force review. Yes, sir. We're talking two different things here. Well, this the, the is not the task force. This is the Air Force audit agency findings. I see. Now they are findings, and you disagree with those findings. Those fi we that, agreed that with Air those Force findings when the audit monitor. agency came up with those. Pardon? We agreed with those when the audit agency came up with them. What I now know is that when the audit agency looks at a project in Europe, they can only look at the U.S. side. Uh, that's like looking at the tip of an iceberg and judging the whole iceberg. Well, GAO created uh, some findings as well. Do you disagree with their findings? It uh, depends on which ones you're talking about, well, sir. Well, with you regard to, to the, the work of the Air Force and the, and the uh, uh, having sufficient staffing to oversee the complex, uh, to uh, properly monitor and approve the contractor payments, and uh, adequate policies and controls in place. I think sir, GAO addressed those as well. Yeah, here's what happened. It's a question on any given day through the process of building this facility. What do you know at the time? In this project, LBB hired another firm to act as a surrogate general contractor because they were directed not to have a general contractor. That general contractor surrogate failed miserably and did not inform LBB of all the situation on the site. LBB subsequently did not inform the Air Force. So the story Does the Air, the Air Force, Force have getting, any responsibility or is it all the contractor's fault? Sir, I will tell you that the Air Force has responsibility. We execute the responsibility based on what we know at the time. Uh, as I look back at those times, the question becomes what was reasonable at the time based on what you knew. I have reams of facts that show that the, uh, the efforts made by Air Force people at the time seemed reasonable. Now that I have more information from the surrogate GC, the general contractor, and from LBB, what their internal memos said at the time, I realized the situation the Air Force people were trying to manage was completely different from reality. Let me ask Mr. Kurtz. It seems to me, to me that we don't have an acknowledgment from General Rogers to what the findings were from 
the internal audit of the Air Force that there were some mistakes by the Air Force. Do you, do you agree that, um, that, 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 that uh, those findings were incorrect and General Rogers is correct? We would agree with the Air Force Audit Agency findings. And, and, and last year you asked, I think, General Gardner, when they first became aware that there were real problems, he told you December 2005, a couple months before the project was supposed to be done, how could you say you didn't have Air Force oversight problems when you became aware of the problems a couple of months before the ribbon cutting ceremony? It doesn't make any sense, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Well, General Rogers, what's past is past, but it seems to me it's important to have some acknowledgement of, um, of uh, the problems that existed and how they came to be and the responsibility of the Air Force. It sounds like the Air Force is in denial mode and that's not very comforting if you don't deny if you deny what happened in the past I fear you might be likely that you yourself but the Air Force might be likely to make some of the mistakes again sir I'm on, not in a denial mode uh, I acknowledge what happened in the past my job is to figure out why it happened I, I do now understand why the Air Force Audit Agency then GAO could come up with these findings that we also would agree with they were inadequate controls etc the issue is, why did it happen? For example, Mr. Coote says, why did we learn in December the 05 that this facility is going to be late when it's only a couple months from delivery? Uh, the delivery date being promised in December 05 by the construction agent and showed to the KMCC Council with all the stakeholders, German government officials, AFES services, everybody at the table, was April or May of 06. At that time, there were 16 weeks of construction work remaining. And if you look at the clock, you'd say, well, there's the building. It's standing, looks right. 16 weeks from now, they're telling us 16 weeks. It's going to open in 16 weeks. You don't have a reason to question that. And when you go out and look at the site, you can correspond work to invoices you are getting. Uh, so as you can see, the issue here was one of transparency. My well, finding just, is, yeah. I'm sorry, sir. I, my I finding is you. that uh, once this construction project broke ground, there was a difference in the rate of information that flowed from the surrogate general contractor to LBB and from LBB to the Air Force. And as you went through time, that lag in situation awareness continually grew to the point that even in November and December of 05, uh, I now have internal memos from LBB showing that that project was not going to be delivered until the hotel portion until July or August, yet the entire council, which is where they're reporting out the status to the oversight to, to all the stakeholders, that council was briefed this will be here in May. Let me ask Mr. Kutz the last question that I have. Uh, if we hold a hearing next year at this time, are we going to find that uh, we've learned some lessons and they're going to correct the situation or do you think that there's a, a denial going on and it's troubling to you as it appears to be to me? Well, I mean, it's too late for KMCC. I mean, it is what it is at this point. It's a mess. There's, there's a lot of issues. A lot of it's out of our control at this point. The real question is for new projects going forward at the very beginning, before we start spending the money, will we have the people in place? Will we make sure that there's a general contractor or whatever makes sense here? Will we make sure that we're not schedule driven versus you know, driven based upon milestones, et cetera. That's the real test here. I, I think KMCC, it, it, it's, it's really too late. So hopefully there are lessons learned going forward where at the very beginning of the project, they will learn from what's happened here and hopefully not repeat the same situation. Thank you. Um, Mr. Davis, anything further from you? I don't know if Mr. Duncan wanted to ask any questions oh. or not. He's coming. See him come in. No, well, uh, uh, one or two. Very briefly. Uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I was uh, sitting here reading this uh, memo that the staff uh, provided us, and it says, uh, unfortunately, this recent uh, report from GAO is not good. Little work has been completed in the year that has passed since the first hearing, and while the U.S. Air Force and the German government have recently reached an agreement on a plan to complete the project by Jan January 2009, Neither the Air Force nor GAO has confidence that the completion date will be met. The project is now more than two years overdue and the building will suffer from significant structural problems, including a defective roof that is in the process of being replaced. Uh, if neither the uh, Air Force nor the GAO has confidence that the completion date of January 2009 will be met, uh, 
General Rogers, when when is the uh, completion date? Uh, when is this going to, to going to be completed, sir? We uh, we count on our German construction agent to give us the schedule in terms of you know and uh, they figure out how long it's going to take and level of effort and they have offered January not offered they've told us that January 09 is when they expect to turn it over uh, we see indications that uh, they're not while they're performing better than in the past it's not like we should count on January 09 but as I mentioned earlier I at least have a little more confidence in this schedule uh, in only slipping a few months versus years because contractors have at least signed up to this schedule and it's the first hard schedule after years of begging that uh, LBB has given us since November of 04. And this uh, memo also says that uh, total costs to complete the project are unclear. The Air Force contends it will spend $162 million. But the JO estimates the cost to complete the project will be over 200 million. What do you say about that? Why? Uh, where is the disagreement between the Air Force and the GAO? The the Air Force and the GAO are really saying the same thing here, sir. The 163 alludes to pure construction costs. That one should be about seven to seven and a half million under the spend under the agency approved amount for construction. The other costs that take it over 200 million include furniture and equipment, secondary services, design fees that are not included in construction that are normal in any construction project, and, and just about all of those would have been spent even if we completed it on time. Uh, last year, the discussion seemed to be all about the construction costs being out of control, uh, so those other costs weren't really brought up. The Air Force tracks them carefully. Uh, which is why we're able to provide them to the GAO, GAO when they ask. Uh, but they are, a, we're basically saying the same thing. Well, do you have somebody now who's in charge of this who has major construction experience? Yes, sir. We uh, had to delay a little bit last year to stand up uh, and consolidate the management office because our colonel was deployed to Iraq. We got him back, and as soon as he came back, uh, he plowed into this, and he's doing a great job. All right. Thank you very much. I yield back. To Mr. Chase. I, I'm not going to take the full five minutes because I wasn't here. But uh, could I be? Could we have it clarified for the record why there was no general contractor, uh, a U.S. general contractor, overseeing this? You want me to answer that? Yes, sir. I can. Uh, during investigation of this project, I found letters from previous vice commanders of USAFE and meeting minutes where USAFE officially and repeatedly asked for a general contractor. Uh, additionally, the Minister of Defense in Germany wrote letters to German government agencies saying, you're going to need a general contractor or this thing's going to go afoul. Uh, however, there were German, uh, other German bureaus and political interests who insisted on trade lot contracts because they like us, have rules and laws that in ensure that small business has opportunities, etc. And in those initial days, when told that we wouldn't get a general contractor, the uh, people overseeing the project accepted it in the sense that there were only about four trade lots envisioned at the time. But nobody had a clue that it was going to grow to over 42. Yeah. And, and just a question, uh, we had a project manager on this, pro on this project, someone? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me just try some up. I, we, I'd be happy to yield. Thank you. We just don't want to be here next year going through the same thing. And I guess the real variable here is the Germans and the contractors and how they act. What, uh, and you, we have the controls in at the Air Force, as I understand it. Uh, so we're all ready to go. The, the real question is, are the German contractors going to show up? Uh, are they going to be able to do the job? Are they going to show up in the numbers that we need to get this thing done? Time? Am, am, am I missing anything, or is that, 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 is that the essence of where we are right now? Yeah, and I think that the other thing that's been discussed here, too, whether that German l amount is a loan or a grant or whatever the case may be, because that will have to be sorted out probably later as to who's going to pay for what. But with respect to physical progress and getting it done, I think we would agree with that. I mean, I just, just tell me we're not going to use this procedure again. General. Well, sir, under ABG 75, we're obligated to use a German construction agent, which in that region is LBB. 
What we intend to do is a lesson. Now, is this a State Department this. agreement or a military agreement? I'll ask Ms. Garber. I'll answer for it, both, it's a, sir. It's a mil it's agreement between uh, the forces and the Germans. Yes. Can we change the agreement? Yeah, and is that agreement, does that have a 10-year time frame? Is, it, uh, just, is that just part of the agreement for our bases being there? Is that the? Yes, sir. The Germans conclude agreements like this with all forces, uh, all nations who send like forces to America. Germany. Kind like by America. Okay. And uh, it will be changed if the forces at some point uh, decide to renegotiate. But, but you, we, Mr. Goose, um, we did note we did have other options when this. There uh, are clearly provisions in ABG 75 for the U.S. to, in some cases, demand, insist, and request. And the option for using a general contractor, I think the U.S could have insisted on the use of and, and I guess contract. my question is, we've learned from this so that next time we'll handle it differently within the confines of that agreement. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, the Germans agree because this didn't work. <laughs> this for embarrassment them. for them. And too. it's now costing. And no. well, believe thank me, the impact on them is more than us. Good. Well, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I thank you all for uh, advising us where we stand with this project, and I appreciate your being here today. That uh, concludes our business, and the committee stands adjourned.